Thank you.
what was it during the recovery? Do you recall? Yeah. Yeah. So here, you know, I'm, I commute through Silicon Valley, and you can tell how the economy is doing by Interstate 101. Who, who's been on Interstate 101? Anyone been on Interstate 101? Have you ever been on Interstate 101 when the economy's really good? Did you average more than 10 miles an hour? Right. So you can tell how the economy is doing in Silicon Valley based on Highway 237 or Highway 101, and, um, and usually you can't move. Uh, when the economy is bad, no one's going to work, and, and 101 like ghost towns. Did anyone ever see the Excited Home Headquarters campus in Redwood City? Has anyone ever seen that campus? That was the peak of hubris in the, in the early 2000s, before the dot-com crash. Half a million square feet, beautiful gleaming white buildings built out on landfill. <laughs> Never occupied. Uh, and so you know in Silicon Valley when, when those times hit. And, and I would say that uh, during this last recovery, things were a lot like that. Um, and, and we tend to backfill for employment opportunities there with imported labor. That really is not a good solution. And I'm going to show you a few reasons why. We have wasted assets, uh, lots of wasted assets, partly in the form of our people. This is uh, uh, inspired by Cal State Hayward. I lived next to Cal State Hayward for quite a long time. The Cal State Hayward campus is unencumbered by people. It's a tragic vacancy. And so what occurs to me is, is the issue there is that the California State University system doesn't understand the real estate asset it holds. If they did, they would rent out the empty classrooms and they weren't using them to other private trainers or anyone else who might be able to use them. Uh, and so the classroom of the future is not going to look anything like it looks now, and I'll talk about a few examples. Here's another kind of representation of wasted assets. If you look at dropout rates in, in the big cities around the country, there's a chronic problem, and it has been true for a very long time. Big cities have dropout rates that look like about 25% of their high school population. It is awful, and it shouldn't be considered acceptable to anybody. It's the same in Seattle as it is in San Jose and Los Angeles as Chicago. Do we have, there's a topic later on the agenda that says, addressing skilled worker shortages. Where should that come from? How about the wasted talent that we're not using right now? It already exists, and we're not using it. There we go, let's see if it works. Not yet. Am I missing it? I might be missing it. Oh, there we go. Here, here. There. Aha. Aha. Okay. Thank you. So um, the 25% dropout rate is just the first order of the problem, and I'll get to a second order of the problem in a second. Uh, this is just an emphasis on low-income students. So if you wonder where the human resource could be coming from, you know, we have a chronic nursing shortage in the United States. Have you ever thought, gosh, what if India turned itself to training nurses? You, you could produce 100 million nurses in a pretty quick order of time. Except we don't intervene in other people's economies that way. What if we actually intervene in our own economy that way? The town is already here, and we're not taking advantage of it. Uh, this is a national problem, and that's why I pulled this map off of uh, the kind of nation's report card to show that. The pink, although it's a little hard to see, says 79% and below is the graduation rate <coughs> in those pink states in long time too. That's all. And it's literally not just Los Angeles, it's what it is. This is, um, <clears throat> there's a bit of comic relief in this slide, if you look real closely, I'll show you in a second. But this is degree attainment, and it's not unique to the United States, but generally speaking, we have about 35% of our population with college degrees. I don't know about you, I, I have a degree in the truly hard science, political science. <laughs> so I know that I didn't take advantage of the aptitude I might have had in math or gone further to our sciences. But the science numbers are even smaller, as you'd appreciate. Uh, and so there's a lot more we could be doing with getting people through four-year degree programs as well. If 65% of our population doesn't have a degree, technical workforce shortages could be met in that gap. The margin is more than the majority of the population. Here's the common um, relief part. That number on, this, on the chart on the left says that the US is at about 33%. That number on the right 
says that the U.S. is about 43%. I have no idea why. The data is probably bad in both cases, but it does give an indicator that ballparking here, let's just ballpark it. We can ballpark that somewhere around uh, 180 million Americans don't have a college degree. Now, is this a symptom or the problem? I'm going to argue it's a symptom. And that it's very possible, if not already occurring, that degrees don't have anything to do with skills. And I'll show you some examples of why that model's changing. And if you're working currently in a four, who works in a four-year university setting? Yeah, who works in a two-year university setting? Your model is being destroyed all around. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how. Um, people can shop for a course like they're at the grocery store. They don't need your diploma anymore, and that's going to be a problem for a lot of institutions. <laughs> Love this guy for his quotability. <laughs> <laughs> Grammar, not his strong suit. But it's still a great question. So are we putting enough people through the system to get them out? Uh, I have a great quote in a recent talent in initiative white paper that we did at CTC from an officer of a big biotechnology company called Gilead. And the executive of Gilead said, um, we import talent. And there's a long story, and I didn't quote it all in the white paper, but among the things he told me was that on Friday afternoon, they'd have someone accept a job offer and then go look for housing. And they'd come back on Monday and say, I can't take the job because there's no way I can afford to live here. And so that's really common in, in the Bay Area. Uh, but his answer to that was, this is not a sustainable answer. It's led companies like Iliad to do something called an aqua hire. You've got a couple aqua hires in here in town, actually. Companies have stayed after buying something. As a way to fill up, in Gilead's case, 900 employees in Boulder and Seattle instead of having to find those 900 employees in the Bay Area. So there's economic development opportunity there. Instead of losing companies, capturing their downstream investment. Uh, and, and that aqua hire issue is a real one in places that are exploding. Well. Learning is still the key question. And, and here's a challenge that I would like to actually back this up to. Do you ever wonder why a state budget grows and grows and grows and nobody remembers why it was $150 million smaller two years before and what the spending level was? Well, the same could be said of educators and education. Abe Lincoln self taught. He put himself through law school, not through any law school. He went to the bar and passed and became a lawyer on his own pace. Did either Alexander Graham Bell or Thomas Edison have the resources to uh, go into a lab today and, and do what they did with tremendous infrastructure and all the facilities that we have now? Of course not. So if you were forced into an environment where you were bootstrapping yourself along, what might it look like? I would assert to you today that it might look like what their resources looked like 150 years ago. It's not all that hard to imagine. A kid in a garage tinkering now with DNA. In fact, it is happening. And I'll show you a couple of examples of, of where. Are we self-sufficient? Maybe not. But is the generation coming? How many of you employ millennials? How many of you would argue that you understand millennials? <laughs> yeah. Got a couple of great people from millennials. Uh, so, the first possibility that I want to lay down a little bit more information on for you is how people are accessing learning now. And if you've not been through this yourself, I would just, if you don't understand why this is a challenge or a threat, spend an hour, even if it's on the weekend, looking at any of the examples of massive online open courses I'm about to show you. Just spend an hour looking around, and you'll see why this is tearing down the fabric of the system the way that we have today. These are two uh, uh, MOOC companies, basically, companies that offer these platforms every day and their data. Uh, the one on the left is Coursera, and the one on the right is edX. Coursera is independent, it's venture-backed, it's a, basically a platform venture-backed startup. And they don't generate any of their own content, they partner with contents, uh, content providers. The one on the right, edX, is an example of, this is really fascinating, of the vested interests fighting back. So edX is Harvard and MIT, and now others, trying to put their content online and make it available. Did it work? They went from 
150,000 people and 3 million people in about three years using our online courses. In their most kind of populous course, which is called CS50, Computer Science 50, it's kind of a primer to computer science engineering. There are now about 200,000 people enrolled from everywhere, requiring and not interested in any degree, nothing, nothing required. And from their home or their garage or from their desk, possibly working for you and not working. Uh, and so that is happening already. And I think what's amazing about some of these data points is if you look at the, the maps that each one has, the phenomenon is global. You could access these courses from Harvard or MIT if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or South America. And that's one of the, I think, most unique things about how these skills are translatable through online coursework. So should you accept limitations if you're in Worthington, Minnesota, or Sioux Falls, or God bless the people, those poor people in Fargo? There are no limits. And no one in any region would be limited as long as they have access to some kind. Does that mean broadband is your bigger limit? Probably. But you can access these programs anywhere. Now, some of the coding academies and other uh, sort of, of the new class of institutions have set up free entry level programs. So, General Assembly is a coding academy that's national. In fact, it's global. It's got campuses in London and, and Asia as well as across the US. And they wanted to set up an entry level program that would allow you to learn HTML or learn how to design a website. So, they set up a, a little unit called Dash. And if you've ever wondered what HTML looks like, or you're curious, I would highly recommend that you go and play with that. <coughs> Dash is a pretty cool set of free tools. And it's quick. You can get through Dash, a couple Dash programs in, you know, maybe a day or two. It's not going to teach you to be a little coder or, you know, to be a potential financial terrorist hacker. I know some of you aspire. Just keep it under control. But you will get very cool tools with HTML, and you'll learn a lot. Uh, about things that you've probably been curious about. And so I think it's pretty remarkable that they look at this as a way to give back a little bit and to create uh, really just a pathway, a careers pathway, if you will, through a free product. So what? Well, here's where that kind of psychology of millennials comes into play. Why are young professionals flocking into these programs by the millions? Well, this young man was, was interviewed by NPR, and his answer uh, was really about how empowered he felt by doing this himself, finding his own way, and setting his own course. Didn't require a four-year degree in computer science engineering at Stanford. Didn't require a lot of course uh, prerequisites. Jumped in, learned, and the practical was connected directly to the lab. And so the whole program is a living lab. You might say, so what? That's a coding academy. Software is notoriously light and easy to do anywhere. Anyone know what this is? Anyone? Any guesses? This is something called the BioBricks or iGen competition. This is the class of 2014. Why is this relevant to coding academies? Because a high school team has already won and beat teams from Stanford and MIT and Singapore and Japan and Northern Europe. A high school team made up of kids that happen to be lucky enough to be coached by a former employee of Genentech. High school kids beating MIT. Mostly self-taught. Okay, so paradigm breaker number two is how people are working. And I hope I'll give you a point here or two about uh, why your millennials might not be working for you tomorrow if you're not careful. Uh, so this is really interesting stuff. <clears throat> 50 million Americans plus. Uh, a lot of the data that's here comes from the Freelancers Union. It's a really terrific group that generates a lot of original information. So I highly recommend you take a look at their annual survey. It's remarkable. And look at the sort of market value that they estimate from freelancers. It's bigger than Walmart, McDonald's, and a bunch of Fortune 500 companies combined that workforce. Uh, so it is already happening this way. Uh, what kind of work is being done? Well, again, I would say, you know, certainly you can do this if you're software coding and you can, do, you can see the 
web development figures. Let's see if I have a, a light on here. Um, I'm not sure I do. So, tech and web development, they're about 13%. But healthcare workers, you can do just about anything as an independent now. Scientists at the bottom right there. This is real data. This is live data in the Freelancers Union survey. This is not projected or extrapolated. Why do you freelance? I would, for those of you who employ millennials, I would suggest you commit this slide to memory. Why are they going to work? We have expectations reminded or heaped upon us all the time in Silicon Valley that technology companies don't give back enough. I would just say if you think that, you're not looking very hard because you have companies like a Salesforce building in 1% to give back, and, and the CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benioff, giving $200 million to create a new children's hospital from scratch. So you don't really have to look very hard to find who the new railroad barons are. But you do have to wonder why are people asking that question. It's because they expect that mission orientation to come through their work. And if they're not going to get it at work, they're going to go do it themselves. And so you certainly have the, the kind of usual suspects. It is possible to work this way today because you can stay connected anywhere. Uh, I have a friend that has an accounting firm. His back office is in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is great at generating accounting degrees. They have a bunch of accountants. Wouldn't you like to actually be working on somebody's Excel spreadsheets on the beach in Costa Rica? Or on a zip line in the rainforest in Costa Rica, or whatever it might be. It's possible already now, today. So those are tremendously important factors, and they're directly related to why people are accessing work and learning the way that they are and tearing down what we thought of. I'm going to give you a real case study. So I was the CEO of a startup about four years ago in digital health. You can craft digital health companies from literally anywhere. Uh, and there, if you haven't seen it, there's a great Brookings study from about September of last year about the digital health marketplace and how it's growing and evolving. And I think the most interesting outcome of that study is that it doesn't, the, the patterns of investment and growth in digital health don't obey where healthcare markets are established or where biotechnology markets are established. And it's because you can do this from literally anywhere. <clears throat> That's what my startup looked like. I was the only employee. Every line of code was written by a contractor, most of which, or whom, I never met. I posted little sprints on bulletin boards, and I paid people for those sprints. And I ripped up the codes that no one ever saw at all in one place. No employees. Did I even notice where those contractors lived? <clears throat> Did I ask? Nope. Did I care? No. The only thing I cared about was that that was the real moment when I realized I probably should have done math. Here. I was missing some degree of control over that segmentation of the code because I didn't quite have full grasp of the code. But a remarkable story of being able to build the code for a startup with people, whether they were in India or Germany or in my backyard, and I just didn't know them. And I really did not care. Neither did my investors. $750,000 in annual investment. We lost a race to get to a particular product, the group that beat us at $30 million in equity funding. So we lost the race, and we should have, because they were doing better than we were. But really a remarkable story of, of the ability to build a cobblestone or a patchwork of product development with no employees and all by 1099. Well, what if you were that kid in Reading or Fargo? Let's pick on Fargo because Fargo is my Reading today. Uh, the perfect example of a poor stricken people who are only represented by a, a movie and a TV show on FX now. <laughs> And the example that I use with my own brother about what his accent actually sounds like to the rest of us. Uh, well, how many of you have crowdfunded a project? Nice. What platform do you use? Oh, then it connects to your car and to my car. And where did you raise money for? Well, no, I have paid. Oh, you have? Oh, great. You bought it one. And you've done one as well. Nice. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, that's uh, not a representative population size based on proportions. 
So this is a really a fascinating phenomenon based on its kind of size and reach. That is impossible to see on a large screen there. Hmm. Let me interpret a little bit for you. These are the kind of five or six main areas where crowdfunding has kind of taken a hold. The big purple bar is lending. Would you lend someone money through a web portal if you've never met them? People are apparently willing to do that. Uh, so there are lots of mortgage lending is taking place this way now, which is really fascinating. Uh, lots of donation as well. And so if you're doing things like Kickstarter or MedStarter or even Indiegogo, there are lots of projects in there that are uh, charitable of interest or social impact interests. And you can see the kind of the market size. Well, maybe you can't. Uh, the numbers for 2014 are 15 billion or so. So I apologize the way that that came out for a very large slide. Uh, but that, that 15 billion, not hard to see, it covers a very real market, and you could do this. So let's say you're that poor kid in Reading. <clears throat> let's say you bumped your Dash. Let's say Dash taught you just enough about HTML to be dangerous, so you decide you're going to go take a couple online courses. Now you realize you need to get some work and get some real professional experience. So you go into Odesk, which is not called Upwork. Get yourself a few projects, get some experience under your belt. Then you have an idea about what your first startup is going to be. I'll pick on myself, so let's just say it's a digital health company. And you believe you can start a digital health company and code a way for people to own their own healthcare data and port it around on their own without needing a healthcare system. So you put that project on MedStarter. And you ask people for $500,000 to get it off the ground. And you live in Fargo. It's poor, blessed Fargans. What do we call them? Oh, see. Do we call them Fargans? Fargoans. Fargoans. I'm going to continue to pick up Fargo. I'm not <laughs> You could do all of this today in the modern version of Hewlett Packard's garage from literally any. Uh, the data's not kind of fully in on how crowdfunding did in 2015, but there you can see we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. And the growth curve, by the way, in one year from the gray to the orange bars, 2014 to 2015. Uh, it is growing like that. It's still growing like this. And um, there's a great resource for these data uh, called crowdfunding.org. And I highly recommend you take a look. If you're not already tracking this, your stocks are oftentimes being moved around by crowdfunding platforms. Really interesting public equities moving on crowdfunding. Uh, and that's where a lot of data is going. This is a whole new world. It is not reasonable enough anymore to say, well, we don't have our own venture capital community. People would complain that they don't have Silicon Valley's venture capital community for decades. I know because they came to meet us and asked how they repeat it. I'll talk about that again in a minute. You don't need it anymore. The biggest reason why might be the crowdfunding platforms, but the one that is I'm the expert at doing this for angel-funded venture track technology biotechnology startups. It's called AngelList. How many of you have browsed through AngelList? Same guys are at that table. is really good. You should meet with them. Uh, AngelList is a place where you can go as a sophisticated investor, register, and participate. And if you're not a sophisticated investor, you can give $1,000 or $5,000 to someone who is and ask them to pool your investments for you. That's how AngelList has made these things democratically available to Main Street. Does anybody know what the Jobs Act was? The Jobs Act set up the securities rules for doing all these things. So you, Main Street now has some protections from the Securities and Exchange Commission for investing this way. You could do this as Joe Average from anywhere and find cool projects or propose a cool project from wherever you are on any platform. So you say, so what? You can do that if you're a digital health company. What about biotech is just too hard? Bull. These are all biotech and medtech specific platforms. If there was a market, would there be six platforms? If there was not a market, excuse me. No. There's enough velocity and opportunity to support six different platforms. You might say it's an earlier emerging market, so there are, there's bound to be some consolidation. Probably true. Any market that's new probably goes out a little too far and then contracts and consolidates. So these six, there's actually more, because Indiegogo also does uh, technology projects. 
Hollywood just lost its CEO and went back to the White House. They might not survive, because that's a pretty significant guy. So maybe there's five. Biotech or health-related crowdfunding platforms about six months from now after Hollywood dies or gets merged away. That's a big market. Now, not 15 billion, that 15 billion dollar crowdfunding market that I was talking about is the whole kit and the Google. Not just the kit, not just the Google, kit and the Google. So what this represents is a fantastic way for you to explore what might be happening in some kid's garage in Fargo. If you've not browsed through these platforms, have a look. One of them is actually European. We see. So you can even browse through what somebody's doing in Copenhagen. <clears throat> well, that also turns out to be impossible to see. Who could read that? Nobody. You can read it. Okay. Can you tell who the two investors are? Okay, so this is Peter Thiel on the left. I'm the rising guy called Sean O'Sullivan. Why is this important? They've both decided they don't give a rat's, they don't care where you live. They're going to invest in everything and everywhere. Peter Thiel's group in, for biotech is called Breakout Labs. They do seed investing. <clears throat> and they're structured really unusually. Their structure is an evergreen foundation, which means if they invest in you as a seed fund investment, they're not actually doing that for their own aggrandizement. They're doing it so you can take, hopefully, that growth capital, successfully grow, and then plow it back in for the next cohort, not for them. Peter Thiel's already made his money. Does anybody know who Peter Thiel is? Same guys! I'm spending my afternoon with you guys. Peter Thiel is one of the founders of eBay. PayPal, really. He's the PayPal Mafia. And if you've not read the story about the PayPal Mafia, it's worth looking into these six guys or so. One of them is this really interesting character, Elon Musk. Did anyone put a deposit down on a Model 3 last week? No deposits? Do you know what happened on that one day last week? In 24 hours, 125,000 deposits at $1,000 a piece. That's $125 million in non dilutive financing. Have you ever raised $125 million? How about in one day? <laughs> Elon Musk did that in one day. The PayPal Mafia is a very interesting group of people. Piero Vidyar is doing similar things, but this happened to be Peter Thiel's example. So again, that group is called Breakout Labs. I don't know, I didn't look very closely. I don't know if they actually have an investment locally in the Midwest, or five. I bet they do, I just haven't. Same thing with the group on the right. Sean O'Sullivan is actually a New Yorker. He's set up an accelerator in San Francisco. He's got another one in Ireland, another one in Shanghai, and he does not care where you live. If you have a startup that's novel enough, he'll bring you over for a little while. He'll coach you for 14, month, uh, 14 weeks, and then they set you on your way. But they're a little unusual as accelerators go. They don't just say 14 weeks and you graduate. Note to the wise. I'll make a, an off-the-record comment about those 14 week accelerators in just a second. Sean O'Sullivan stays with his portfolio companies until they're profitable. It's not just about going through a 14 week program and graduating for him. His biotech program is called IndieBio. His software and kind of Internet of Things program is called Accelerator. So, do these coding guys think they can do this in biotech? Yep, absolutely, they're already doing it. Does it translate? Eh, be interesting to see. In the bio, really interestingly, who's built a wet lab here? Yeah, you wouldn't do this. In the bio built a wet lab in a basement in San Francisco. Probably a bad idea. A few woods and all. So somebody upstairs is getting high on the company's gas. <laughs> What is bad about these 14 week accelerator programs? Anybody have any kind of feedback that they've been through on anyone? anyone? What's bad? The average turns out to be, actually, just at South by Southwest about two weeks ago, a group published an update on the averages of these accelerator programs. These programs run 10 to 14 weeks, and they're charging on average 6% in equity. There already is a backlash among, among entrepreneurs, because you know what that really amounts to? Is 6% of your company for some really good, slick PowerPoint coaching. And people are pissed. And they should be. You should expect more. Or you know, one separate accelerator, because it turns out to be a really quick way to make 6% in every company that goes through. Not recommended. So entrepreneurs are getting angry, and they're going to look for better ways. They're going to end up in places like Sean O'Sullivan's group because of the amount of long term support that they get from participating. That uh, program, that, that 
presented this data at South by Southwest is called the C Accelerator Research Project, I think. SARP, how much time? So I don't, I don't want to um, pretend that everything that's happening in Silicon Valley relates to everyone else. I fully recognize that I'm a Minnesotan living in what really amounts to Florence during the time of the Renaissance. It is amazing to be there. Um, it's also crazy to be there. There's no reason at all, anywhere on earth, that Uber should have been valued at $19 billion. It shouldn't have been. It's insane. And maybe it's only because you have Midwestern, Midwestern sensibilities that you recognize how stupid that is. Most people there recognize that there's some representation of a bubble in some of those numbers, but um, it is a fascinating place to be. No region should try and compare itself to Silicon Valley. How it happened there, no one really knows. It is not a master plan development. It's a series of accidents in history. It was not planned. Should you try and repeat it? Absolutely not. How do you create local context? By capitalizing on things that you have their strengths. It's possible to do any number of these things here. I would already drove by the poet ethanol plant coming down. I would argue that if you were just going to take an approach to methane capture, you have plenty of feedstock locally here to be a carbon neutral location for any place else. There are plenty of opportunities to exploit in lots of different niches and markets where there's room for entrepreneurship. I happen to be a shareholder in an anaerobic digestion company. <clears throat> What's interesting about that market is the technology is centuries old and it really has never been improved much. There's opportunity like that if you look closely. We have a, my company has a, um, a $50 million project in a state north of California and south of Washington that I won't name. Uh, $50 million after issuing bonds to finance the project. They then ask the question, huh, you know, we haven't actually considered what comes out of our process. Might have asked that question before financing a $50 million facility. But it is interesting that no one has optimized processes like that, even with centuries old technology uh, everywhere. Where have we been? These are again examples not to try and live up to, but the guys on the left are the founders of Fairchild that left uh, and started uh, what became really the, the kind of king of the, the king of companies in semiconductors, Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce and others. On the right there is a guy called Fred Terman greeting Hewlett and Packard. Fred Terman was the dean of engineering at Stanford who decided he was going to change Stanford policy and say, of course we want faculty to start companies. This is the San Diego example. Why am I showing you this? Because it's a much smaller region. And yet, really one guy in San Diego started everything there. A guy called Roger Revelle, he's on the left. He attracted faculty like Erwin Jacobs and Ivor Royston. Those two guys are almost single-handedly responsible for what now is a telecommunications cluster and a biotech cluster in San Diego. All because of one guy, Roger Revelle, who attracted them to a faculty at UCSD. Last week I was in Moncton, New Brunswick. Why? <laughs> well, the Technology Council of North America held their annual meeting there together, so um, my colleague Margaret, your CEO here, that makes you feel smart enough not to go. I went, uh, and I learned something really interesting there. Uh, Moncton's really small, really, really small. I, you know, I had never been that far, uh, on, on the North American continent, I had not ever been that far. But there were a couple of companies there that had grown up locally, and exited. Radiant 6 was bought by Salesforce. Have any, any of you ever tinkered with Radiant 6? Holy cow, you did not know these things were possible. If you want to search for conversations about, let's say, cancer in social media, Radiant 6 will let you do a search term like cancer and pull in everyone who's talking about cancer. You know what's the scary part? They'll also pull in all of their contact information, their profiles, their phone numbers, their email addresses. Wow. That guy built that company years and years ago. So I wanted to ask him a question. So this podcast has not yet aired. I'm going to play you about two minutes of sound here. If I get it to come up. Here it is. And hopefully it's not going to blow your ears out. And, uh, where was Radian 6 headquartered and, and what's the legacy been in that community? Yeah, so we built it in a very um, small town in Atlantic Canada on the east coast of Canada, uh, east of Maine actually. Most people don't, you know, a lot of maps looks like there's just water there, but there's actually land. 
And, um, and yeah, we built a global company from here. Uh, yeah, we had offices in other places as we grew, but uh, our entire uh, technology team we built in this kind of rural area. So uh, that's something that um, we did just because this is where we lived and this is where we grew, and we just never thought about that being any uh, advantage or disadvantage. And I, I probably just revealed my Canadianness by saying about, right? Yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So before that, you, you told the story earlier about uh, taking a company out on NASDAQ in 2000, which would have been a whole thing by itself. But uh, was that also a, an Atlantic Canadian company? And, and so <clears throat> you've obviously built a track record here. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing I'm getting at is you can do this anywhere. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah, we actually were built the first tech company to go public on the NASDAQ in this region. and. Um, and that was a whole different time. Um, but yeah, I, you know, a lot of people ask me, in fact, locally, a lot of people will, will kind of dig for that question, like, can't you do it from here? And it's something I always kind of go, I never really worried about that question. We just did it. You know, we were, we were everywhere we needed to be. Um, we, you know, built relationships globally. No one really really even thought too much about where we were. Um, the one exception to that might have been when it comes to uh, discussions around exits, then you think, okay, does this company who's based wherever, you know, want to acquire a company who's based wherever? And a lot of times, you know, Silicon Valley companies have largely been acquiring companies in Silicon Valley, but that's completely changed. And a lot of the bigger players are, you know, buying companies all over the world. We're seeing, you know, tech hubs emerge in, you know, in Israel and, you know, north of Europe and in all over the world. And uh, yeah, for us, it's just, um, you know, this, it's a global market. We have incredible talent here, and we've been very successful. In fact, I haven't had to worry about uh, competing with Google and like competing with Facebook, you know, for talent. And that's been a huge advantage, really, to be able to, you know, uh, retain your team. Yeah. So that podcast was up in full in a week or two. But the point is, Moncton's a really small town. Moncton, New Brunswick. How could they possibly have anything over even Fargo? <laughs> so, let's revisit what we we're trying to do here today. Did we point out what the threats are to the existing academic infrastructure? I hope so. Uh, did we point out ways that you can overcome the tyranny of distance? Hope so. Could you be a student of any age and take any of those massive online open courses? I think so. Uh, does our existing commitment in four-year colleges and universities necessarily lead to empty real estate? I'm going to argue yes. And do we have the tools and networks now, already today, to totally circumnavigate that existing system? I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to try and leave open a minute or two there for questions. Sir, how do you get started? Well, I mean, a Bloomington? Yeah. Yeah. What network? How do you go? Why do you have to go there? Why right? don't you stay in Bloomington? I could have done what I chose. Well, first of all, political science is impossible. Science. Uh, so I made a, I, I, I'm probably an unfortunate story. So I, uh, I made a commitment while shoveling my driveway. <laughs> that I would go to college anywhere in the Sun Belt that would let me come. So um, my parents had four boys, five kids, and they never owned a snowblower. Maybe the moral of the story is don't count on your four boys to be your snowblower. Because uh, I was committed to leaving. I was going to get out at any cost. And so I went to the University of San Diego and fell in love with California. Uh, I love being in Minnesota and California, and there are lots of us out there. It is a very interesting place to be in Minnesota and watch. Uh, but I've never lost in Minnesota. Oh, yeah. 